most people have not had the opportunity to even you know abolish hunger get drinking water and so on degrowth is okay to talk about in the richer countries in the poorer countries we need to talk about decommodification of some of these things i want to just talk about the the solutions to climate change that i see coming through a three part recipe which is policy technology and finance and uh, each of you has already covered uh, some of that to some degree, but also in the sense of what the barriers are. But I see enormous possibilities, especially if we end the concept of waste. One slide that I was going to show you here in Los Angeles, we get very little rain, but when we get it, it comes down in buckets. We get an average of 12 rainstorms a year and they're very violent. We get a lot of rain. And there was a community in the North Los Angeles area called Sun Valley that was flooded out every year and no way to get rid of the water without flooding their homes and businesses. So a, a very creative city planner realized that there was an old dilapidated city park and that if you dug up that park and you put in cisterns, just ordinary old Roman technology, thousands of year old technology, probably actually invented by the Chinese even before the Romans. And they now capture 8,000 acre feet of water, which is a lot of water. So they now collect 8,000 acre feet a year which is about four times what their community needs. So they sell the rest to the water agencies. Another example of that, uh, of where policy actually started all of this was with California wanting to be energy efficient. Back in the 1970s, Governor Jerry Brown, who later became governor uh, just 10 years ago, five years ago, um, again, back in the 70s, he was governor and he formed the California uh, Energy Commission. And one of their mandates was to find ways to make energy use more efficient. And so the policymakers uh, started to mandate that refrigerators would become more efficient over time. Of course, they did their homework. They had to prove that it was technologically feasible, but, uh, but they mandated that the refrigerators, TVs, all kinds of other appliances would have to become more and more efficient over time. The same way we regulate cars to be more and more clean over time and more energy efficient to get more miles per gallon over time. And that led to all kinds of innovation in the, in the technology. And the result is that California is today 40% more energy efficient than the rest of the United States. And I could go on with quite a few other examples. We imposed a small fee when you buy a television in California, for example, or a new computer, you pay $4 or $8 recycling fee. That money goes into a fund, which then the recycling industry, if you recycle electronic waste, you can apply for 47 cents per pound for every pound of electronic waste that you recycle from that fund. So that way you're subsidizing this new industry. And the result is uh, when I was EPA secretary in 2005 and we kicked this program off, uh, today, millions of tons of electronic waste come through an enormous industry that didn't exist before, that created jobs, that's harvesting a wide variety of metals and plastics and even uh, computer components that can be recycled and resold and reused. It's created an amazing industry. So policy really matters. But of course, the technology matters too. So when I was EPA secretary, I had to comply with a new law that required us to reduce emissions from cars, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which previously had never been regulated. And it was my job, my staff's job, to prove that whatever measures we took or whatever we, we said the car industry had to meet was technologically and economically feasible. So it was important for us to know that. And sure enough, it's one of the reasons that hybrid cars like the Prius or other hybrid vehicles were invented. And so that led to all kinds of innovation, which of course we found was technologically and economically feasible. But the last piece of that recipe of policy, technology, and finance, I think comes into, uh, into play when we're looking at large scale things like uh, large scale renewable energy projects, especially in developing countries where investors might have uh, a challenge to understand the market or understand the risks. And that's why I work a lot with uh, finance institutions, the UN Green Climate Fund, uh, philanthropists and other kinds of uh, investors who are willing to build blended capital products. So we have, for example, uh, recently created the Subnational Climate Fund, which is a, a $750 million investment fund. Uh, it's about to be followed by a $2 billion one just for India. 
where we uh, invest in these climate solutions at scale, uh, but 20% of the capital stack is provided by these concessionary uh, investors, Green Climate Fund and others. So they take the first risk and that makes it more attractive to senior conventional investors, pension funds and so on to come in as the senior investors. In India, for example, we've been working in Gujarat, the Western state of Gujarat with 18 municipalities on uh, waste projects, which probably wouldn't have been viable in the past, but thanks to Prime Minister Modi, they are today. So it worked in many places, but now these small municipalities have overflowing landfills. So we're working with them to turn that material into something useful. The other uh, program that is helping that uh, is the Satat program, which uh, is trying to develop the biogas industry in India because India doesn't have much of a, an oil and gas industry. So all of that is imported, as Vijay mentioned before, but you can make biogas from uh, organic material, particularly food waste and organic and, and agricultural waste, um, and turn that into methane, which can then be burned in uh, buses and, and taxis and even the tuk-tuks that drive around Delhi and other things. So again, the policy led to the economics uh, and, and even the technology in that case uh, with these 18 municipalities, we're helping them with turnkey uh, kits in essence that will convert 150 tons uh, per day of organic waste into biogas and 150 tons of other material that you can't recycle, the material that's too hard to recycle into a refuse derived fuel, which ultimately will be converted into a low carbon jet fuel with new technology uh, coming out of California. And these are all things which work because the policy is set to reduce emissions, the, the mandates are set, whether it's on the car industry or the aviation industry or whatever, the technology is available. So we as government officials can mandate something that's possible. And then the third piece of course is finance. And then the last thing I wanna say relates to China. We've been working for some years with uh, Xia Shenhua, who is the uh, Chinese negotiator for climate change. And uh, he was a, a good friend, is a good friend, and uh, was a colleague when I was in government uh, 15 years ago, and we started a relationship. And that led to initially a track two uh, negotiation to try to work on uh, a carbon cap and trade system for China. Well, as many of you may know, there now is a carbon cap and trade system in China on the power sector. It's very similar to the one in the northeastern states here in the U.S. So that if we could link the carbon markets in the U.S., Canada, and uh, China with the carbon market that exists in Europe, you could have by 2025 a price on carbon on about 40% of the world's economy. And uh, that would then allow other subnational and national governments to join in in order to meet their uh, nationally determined contributions to, uh, to the climate solution. Um, so I think that's one of the other keys is putting a price on carbon that, uh, that is meaningful uh, in order to get to those things that are very hard to decarbonize. So I'll leave it at that and just say, I think the solutions are out there but we need to look to our government for the policy. We need to look to the technology providers to make sure that the policies can be more aggressive and, and more progressive. And then to the finance community that will always be the last to come to the table because they wanna see proof of something over and over again before they put real money to work. But that can happen because it's already happening in different parts of the world. We need it to happen faster everywhere. Thank you. You see, Terry said something really interesting at the end of his remarks. He said that finance is the last to come to the table. And, you know, finance has to have a sniff that there's some profit there before it takes its seat at the table. I think that was the implication, if I'm not wrong. Look, frankly, I'm not convinced that this is a private sector matter. Um, a provocation was raised at the beginning of state financing, private financing. I'm not convinced. Um, let's, let's just look at this. There's a climate fund that the UN has established, ask of $100 billion a year. Um, that's, we are not even getting a fraction of the money into that fund. From the private sector, I just don't see it. I mean, I, I don't see the kind of... of um, of you know, urgency that is necessary. Because let's be frank, some of these investments are not going to deliver a profit. Take the case of India, the purchasing power is just not there. 
you know, to, um, to dig you out of the massive investment that's needed for the transition. Um, the purchasing part is not there. You're not going to be able to commodify fully the green transition. Questions are raised about degrowth. I think degrowth is a cruel thing to say for a country like India because most people have not had the opportunity to even you know, abolish hunger, get drinking water and so on. Degrowth is okay to talk about in the richer countries. In the poorer countries, we need to talk about decommodification of some of these things. And I'm just going to put a number on the table. You know, at our institute, we looked around at, at studies of illicit tax havens. By the way, illicit tax haven is not my moral judgment. We did a back of the envelope calculation and we found $40 trillion sitting in illicit tax havens. This is totally unproductive money. You know, why can't we suborn this money? If we're going to talk about money, why can't we suborn this money? Why are we walking around... And I am just not convinced. I have not seen any good models for a rate of return for the kind of actual investments we need for the genuine transition, not nibbling around the edges. Nibbling around the edges, you can get a rate of return. If you're going to really come at the heart of the problem, I don't think there's a rate of return on the table. I think for that, we need social funding. For that, maybe we need to look at places like Military expenditure, over $2 trillion a year now. Maybe we need to look at these illicit tax havens. So throwing down the gauntlet on, you know, is, is capital finance innovation going to unlock the capital? Um, Terry, do you, want to, do you want to pick up that gauntlet and, and offer some of your perspective? Well, look, I, I would I would absolutely agree with what Vijay said. And in fact, uh, I, I wrote an op-ed a while ago about the, the new defense budget that you know, climate change is going to get us all. So, so a defense budget should be about solving climate change. And when you look at what the United States spends, we could even just take a third of our defense budget. No one would even notice it was gone, and and you could you could solve climate change in a few years. Uh, kidding aside, no, it's it's uh, it's absolutely where we have to look for the money. But I think to your first point, VJ, is that uh, everything I do in my work now is all around this sense of urgency because we've dithered too long, we've waited too long. So now we can't ignore any solution. So whether it's getting uh, private capital to get whatever return they have to have, and by the way, I don't think that's a dirty word in the sense that a lot of the private capital comes from pension funds. If they lose the money, are they gonna go back to the pensioners next year and say, hey, we, we tried to do something good and, and, and social and green, but we lost a bunch of money. So your pension is going to be 20% less this year. You know, they're just not going to take those risks um, and other investors for different reasons, the same thing. So I try to jujitsu that and harness, okay, what is the return you need? Let's find a way to de-risk it. Let's find a way to get you in the game in some substantial amount because if we just rely on the impact investors and the, the few philanthropic investors, it's not enough. If you can get the trillions of conventional capital into the, into the game, then you have a chance. And yes, it's not enough and it won't be fast enough, but we have to, I just think we have to leave no stone unturned at this point. And yes, we need to push our governments, but you know, think about if you can show an investment might have a return, you're going to get at least some of the wolves sniffing around. But when you go up against the defense industry, you know, I talked about uh, trying to deal with get to a zero waste industry, uh, even here in the United States, where the incumbent Waste Management Incorporated and Republic, the two biggest waste haulers here, have such a lock on the landfills and the collection of waste that you, you almost can't talk about new ways to recycle because the more you take out of the garbage can, the less they can put in a landfill and charge cities for their landfill. So there's a lot of this incumbency around the world that we're fighting that takes a long time. But, you know, again, I just come back to this point that uh, I totally agree, VJ, with what you said, but I think we've run out of time to pick either or, not that that's what you were saying, but, but we can't just wait for governments to come to their senses and defend their people, which, by the way, is the number one thing government is responsible to do is to protect their citizens. And it's the number one thing that every government is failing. Uh, because of climate change. And uh, so, but I think at this point, we've got to, we've got to go anywhere we can and get whatever resources we can and, uh, and make them work. Mm -hmm.